All right. <laughs> uh, my name is Bruce Nielsen, and I'm friends with Phil and Nate. We, uh, we did a project together. Um, remember that? <laughs> and, uh, you know, like Nate and I kind of even go back even further. We worked at STG together, um, worked at Solution Stream together for a while. So, um, probably, I don't know, two years ago, maybe longer, we went to lunch and um, I mentioned to Nate that I was studying quantum computation. And uh, just kind of offhanded mentioned that. And by that point, I, I, don't, I think I had studied it previously and it had been a while. And so I was already starting to forget a lot of it. <laughs> and then like two years later, out of the blue, he goes, do you want to come do a presentation on quantum computation? I'm like, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> So I, I do need to say up front, just, you know, full disclosure, I'm not a physicist. I'm not an expert in this subject. Um, I am just a guy who got curious, and I started buying some books, including a textbook on quantum computation. This would be the beginner entry-level textbook for a graduate class in quantum computation. And the authors of that are the SBNs. <laughs> <laughs> And went through it and thought it was really cool. And, and I talked to people about quantum physics, say, oh, do you know about this? Do you know about that? Um, but that's it. That's really all. I don't have any credentials. I got no authority. You're welcome to disagree with me. I'm not going to care. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to explain to you what I have been able to figure out from going through books and reading, reading about this. Now, I have to tell you that compared to, say, a physicist, I just know nothing on the subject, right? So, I mean, I have a friend who's a physicist, and when I try to talk quantum physics with him, he can tell me all sorts of things I've never even heard of before. However, most physicists are not cosmologists. Vast majority of them are not. I probably know more about quantum cosmology than your average physicist for the simple reason that they've got no interest in it and they've never been taught it and they've never even looked into it. Um, and quantum cosmology is a very um, controversial and you know field where there's a lot of diff diff disagreements. So I went into this because I was curious, which means I'm really looking to cosmology. I learned the most basic math I needed to to be able to figure this out. Now this is a tough topic, even with the reduced math that I learned and I'm going to try to explain. And let me tell you, though, there's nothing in quantum physics that you can't understand. It takes effort, of course, and there's a whole slew of learn this, then you have to learn this, then you have to learn this, and they build on each other. But the math is high school math. It's matri matrices. For quantum computation, it's matrices. Um, and, you know, the... Even the, the science is probably nothing that you haven't been, haven't, didn't learn in high school physics or at least college physics. So it's one of those things where it's a tough subject because it's there's so technical, but it's not tough in the sense that you couldn't learn it. Anyone can learn it. It's tough in the sense that it takes quite a bit of effort. It took me years to, of reading to finally put this all together and figure it out. So, um, and then maybe I'm slow. Maybe you could do it quicker than me. So, um, that's kind of my introduction of my background. Now, let me ask you a question before I do my first slide here. What types of things have you heard about quantum physics? Supposedly it solves MP complete. Supposedly solves MP complete. Okay. What else have you heard? I will neither confirm nor deny anything that you say at the moment. Well, it's the same thing as him, only a different way. Okay, so I'm asking quantum physics, so more general than quantum computation. So uh -huh. you mentioned some things when I came in, the, came in today. What were th the things you heard? The quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement. Okay. What else have you heard about? Faster than light information. Yeah. Faster than if people talk about quantum physics and faster than light communication. Okay, and I, I know you said that because you know it's not true. <laughs> um, there are a lot of things you are going to hear about quantum physics and also therefore about quantum computation. And a lot of it is probably not true. Um, and as it turns out, 
quite a bit of what's not true came from super famous scientists. Um, up here are things that I've heard before, and, I, and where I could, I've put the name of a famous scientist who I know said it. So, you know, mixed consciousness, especially scientifically, Emmett Goswami. He was one of the guys that was, one of the physicists that was interviewed in the movie What the Bleep Do We Know, which on its quantum physics front knew nothing, basically. Um, it's necessary to explain consciousness. Roger Penrose, he's a quantum cosmologist, or a cosmo phys cosmologist. Roger Penrose, I don't know, some of these names, if you've read science books, you may know these names. If you haven't, you won't know who they are. If I were to say, name famous scientists, you'd probably say Stephen Hawking's. Roger Penrose was Stephen Hawking's teacher. Okay, still doing physics. He's probably the second most famous scientist after Stephen Hawking's alive, to, physicist alive today. Um, I don't know, maybe there's some others that I just can't think of off the top of my head. But his name just comes up like everywhere. Once you know it, you just, you can't miss it. Everybody quotes him. Religious people quote him, and physicists quote him. And I mean, and when you read his books, you can understand why everybody grabs something they like and tries to use it. Um, and he's probably the one who did the most to help me understand quantum physics because when he writes a layperson book, he includes the math, which is not something most physicists do, which also makes his books a bit of a challenge. Um, might allow for fast and light communication, Ray Kurzweil. Kurzweil, that name is his name you probably heard. He's with Google. He's uh, the guy who talks about the singularity all the time. And, okay. Um, is the basis for ESP and telepathy. Brian Josephson is a Nobel Prize winner. Um, only applies to the micro world. That was actually the original point Schrodinger was trying to make. Schrodinger? I can't pronounce it. Schrodinger. Was trying to make with, say it again? Schrodinger. Schrodinger. Was trying to make with his cat was that it only affected the micro world. Um, is, it's incompatible with Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, it's impossible to understand. And it's a logical contradiction. I've heard that too. I don't know of any scientist who's ever said that. A scientist would know better. Um, when you look at these here, they're probably false. Based on what we currently know today, probably all of these are false in one measure or another. This one's true, but not in the way Einstein intended it like at all. So, um, and one of the things that I was trying to figure out when I was reading this was how are general relativity and quantum physics at odds with each other, which just about every scientist who writes on the subject says that they are. And I think I understood it in Roger Penrose's book for about mm, 10 seconds and then started to forget it because it was just that technical. So it's, <coughs> I can't explain it today. But it is known that those two are in contradiction to each other. Those, they cannot both be correct. Um, some of these others, you know, I'll give some credit that we don't really know enough. We can't necessarily discredit, say, fashion light communication. But the theory as it stands today absolutely denies it's possible. So it's, it's a bit of a stretch to say that it allows for fashion light communication when, in fact, the theory says that it does not allow for fashion light communication. Of course, the reason why people say that is because of the whole entanglement thing, the spooky action at a distance, that feels like faster than light, and et cetera. So that's why they say stuff like that. But the theory does, absolutely does not allow for it in its current form at least. Um, so, it's, so it's forgivable if you've heard stuff and it's not true. And I do have to tell you, when, I, when you go through and you start to learn about quantum physics, it's really frustrating to read media accounts of it. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, I read this one media account that was trying to explain you know, how... Uh, Life after death was, came out of quantum physics. Or I, I don't know what it was. They quoted two entirely mutually exclusive interpretations of quantum physics in one article as if they were both true. And it's just frustrating sometimes. You know? <laughs> it's, well, I suppose that's true of most subjects when you get to know it and you go, oh man, I, no, but the people who write about this don't know what they're talking about. So, okay, so I'm going to now try to teach the basic uh, kind of mathematics that you're going to need to know to understand. Um, uh, how quantum computation works. Um, I do have to warn you that uh, I can only take you so far because I've forgotten some of the, when I got to the end stuff, when I went through my book trying to prepare for this, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to find a really basic uh, algorithm 
and explain how it worked and take you through the mathematical steps. And I looked at them and they're, they're gobbledygook to me right now. And I, I look at these notes in the margin that I wrote back when I was doing it, and that guy understood it. I mean, he actually, he actually corrects the textbook in multiple places and writes out the mathematics. So I know I understood it at one time, but I understand everything that's in this, and, and it will give you a basic <coughs> intuition for what is quantum computing and what can, what can it do, and more importantly, what can't it do. And um, that, I think, is valuable, but I couldn't even come up with the Deutsch algorithm, which is like super simple. It was math that I can't remember how to do. So, um, so right here, here, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to explain the idea of a deterministic system. So classic, you know, classical physics, we often think of that as deterministic. <coughs> so imagine you had marbles that are, these are six different nodes, zero to five. And you can, I've written like how many marbles, this comes right out of the textbook, by the way, exist at each of the nodes. And then you have an arrow showing where the marbles are going to move to in a time clip whatever time click is, okay? So if I were to ask you, okay, in one time click, how many marbles are at each node? You could, it wouldn't be hard, you could figure it out. You could say, okay, well, there's six here, it has to move over to number five, you know? So there's gonna be six at node five. Oh, no, wait, there's this, these three, okay, there's gonna be nine. I mean, you could add it up and you could figure it out, okay? It's that simple as a deterministic system. Um, now, the way that um, an actual computer scientist would represent this would be through a matrix. One of the things I find interesting is how useful matrix uh, math is. Uh, what are some other things you've seen use matrix math, just even just recently? Even just recently? Yeah, I mean, it's like you start hearing about things all the time and they actually use matrix math for it. So quantum computation uses it, but like, Computer graphics, you're probably really aware, aware that they use matrices for that. In fact, machine learning, one of the reasons why deep learning has taken off was because they spent so much time making these GPUs for computer graphics that just so happened to also be able to do deep learning because deep learning is based around matrix, matrices mathematics. It's a very convenient way to do these sorts of things, and it's just kind of interesting to me how often it shows up again, and they use it for very similar sorts of things to, okay, how's this going to transform into this next phase and things like that. Really good for polynomials, <clears throat> solving polynomials, the end unknowns. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, so what you see here, so you can kind of read how uh, these matrices <coughs> read, is here's the nodes, okay, and this cross-reference shows you which ones are connected. So. You know, node zero is connected to five, so zero is connected to five, you put one there. You know, node one is connected to two, that's that line right there, etc. So one means that there's a connection there, and that's where it's in it, it the role too. Um, this right here represents the number of marbles at each node, and it's the same numbers that you see right there, okay? And then you do vector, vector, matrix vector multiplication, and the result that comes out is exactly the right answer for where, under in a deterministic system, the marbles would be collected. Okay. So, for instance, I just talked about how node five would have nine. There you go. There's the nine at node five. All right. So that gives you a pretty good intuition for how they're trying to use matrices. And of course, if you did that, you could then do another time click and simply multiply this in, and that would give you the new answers. And you can keep going for as long as, you know, something's still changing. All right, so now we're going to talk about prob probabilistic systems, which is more complicated than deterministic systems. I, has anyone seen a diagram like this before? This might be a little familiar if you've looked into quantum physics before. So imagine a gun that's shooting bullets, and you've got these targets, and you've got these walls here. And I, I know this is a little bit unrealistic, because of course the bullets would actually just bump into the wall. But pretend like the bullets are going to go through one of these openings, and then they're going to kind of ricochet off, and they're going to hit one of the targets, okay? And that'll give you, a, if you can imagine that, that'll give you a closer view to how quantum physics actually works. Now, we know that if you were to, let's say you wanted to measure, you know, what are the chances of the bullet being shot here to go to this one versus that one, okay? 
Well, you know, 50% chance it goes to one, 50% chance it goes to another. Okay. Then once it goes to one of these gaps, then each of these, you know, it, it can't reach up that high. So each of these has three targets that it might go to. And let's say that it's equal chance of going to any of them. So you have a one third for each of these paths. This right here is just showing that once it gets to a target, it never leaves. So you want to put it into the matrix that it stays there. And that means a one, you know, hundred percent chance. A one is hundred percent chance. So based on that, we would create a probabilistic matrix, which looks a lot like a deterministic one, but you're using fractions now. Okay, so here is that first time click, you know, the first area that's the 50% for each. Here's the one third split up for each of the two sets of targets. This target was between the two of them, so it gets a one third for each of them. Okay, so that's how they would represent them. These ones are the fact that once it gets to the target, it doesn't move after that. So if we were to take this and multiply it by itself, so square it, okay? Now, you don't need to know how to do the math, but this is what the answer would be, okay? So it, it, it actually makes some pretty good sense, right? So, so for instance, just going back a couple slides here, if I were to say, what are the odds that the bullet's going to wind up there? Well, you know, it's half here and one third there, so one sixth of the time it'll end up there. And, you know, there we, we see it, one sixth. Okay, so now what's interesting here on this one is that one. It properly added those up because they're on both sides, so it has one sixth from one gap and one sixth from the other. Add those in, it's one third. Okay, now how does this apply to quantum physics? Okay, it gets a little harder here now, but the basic idea is exactly the same. Okay, so this is a flashlight now, and these are photons. Notice you had photons on your, your shirt there, you know. Wore the white shirt to the to lecture, yeah. <laughs> so, of course, the world of quantum physics behaves strangely compared to what we have intuitions for, for the classical world, okay? So, but, but the basic idea is the same. That's, this is what I want to kind of emphasize here. So, the, the photon is going to take a path to one of these two gaps, okay? Now, according to quantum theory, unlike the, the probabilistic system, you don't write what are the odds of it going to that, taking that path. Because under the theory, you will take whatever the number is in the matrix, and then you will do a modulus, modulus squared of it. Photons work somewhat similarly. Um, what the big difference, though, is under classical physics, which we were just talking about, or half and half, under quantum theory, the numbers you put into the matrix, you find out where things are, the probability where things are, by squaring it and taking the modulus of it. Now, we don't need to worry about the modulus. The reason why modulus matters is because magnitude does not matter for quantum physics. So you, you, you would have to take the modulus of it. And it would still be a legitimate answer. But it's always easier to simplify it down to the smallest basis, right? So it's really about squaring it. So what, are the, what, what number do I need, can you guess, on each of these lines if when I square it, it gives the correct percentages. Wouldn't it be one? It's one half squared, right? One over two squared. Oh. So if you were to square that, that would be one half. So this, this is saying half the time it goes there, half the time it goes there. OK. Then. This is the one that's interesting. This would be 1 minus i, imaginary numbers, um, divided by square root of 6, which, when you square it, comes out to be 1 third. Okay, so it's exactly what you would expect. Okay. It's just funny because we have to throw these complex numbers in, imaginary numbers. Does everyone remember what an imaginary number is? Does anyone not remember? That it's the, negative, the square root of negative 1, basically. So the i is square root of negative 1. Okay. And, you know, it, it's funny. Um, 
I remember learning about this in junior high or something for the first time, and it's like, why would they even make something like this up? It's just stupid. You know, and, and you know what? That's what the mathematicians believed back when it was first discovered. Okay, they had. If you really look at like the names of the different numbers, it is only with it's only only with resistance have these new, new types of number systems come into being. So you start with the natural number, you know, number natural numbers, and the whole numbers, and the rational numbers, and then the irrational numbers because they didn't like that, so they call them irrational numbers. You know, and then you got the got the imaginary numbers because they're not even really numbers. Okay. The truth is, though, is that quantum physics is, is intimately tied to imaginary numbers. So imaginary numbers are real. They absolutely exist in physics in real life. All right, so what matrix would we draw here? So the matrix, I didn't actually put this, but the first matrix would be the same as the other one except with the square roots. This is if you multiplied it together, you took the square of it. Look how it's actually exactly identical. Oh, this Actually, this is the first one. This is just the squared version of it. Squared, it is identical to the classical version. Okay, there's no difference at the first time click between classical version and the the um, quantum version. Okay, this is the photon has a you know one third chance and one half chance, exactly the same. Okay, here's the thing that's weird though. If you take it with all those imaginary numbers and you do it again, there's one difference. Okay, and you can work the math. I, again, you don't really need to know the math, but if you work the math, imaginary numbers have this weird property where they can cancel each other out. Okay, for the obvious reason that a square root of squ the square of uh, the square root of negative one is negative one, so you can get a negative. And unlike the other ones where the probability is always positive, you can actually have them disappear. And in this case, it's identical to the classical version, except for that one right there. Now, so I still see a one third in there. Is that a typo? It says one six one six zero one third one six. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's that's a typo. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was confused with that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what's going on here. So now, if you're familiar with the double split experiment, which is where most people start with quantum physics you know that the, that cancellation in the matrix means that that target will never be hit. Okay, that's what it means in the real world. Okay, and in fact, that's the truth. If you send a photon through the double split experiment, it will never ever hit that target. Now there's a, kind of some interesting background story here. Um, light, if you went back in time and looked at what scientists believed about light, there's always been a, kind of a wave theory and a particle theory, but originally the particle theory was kind of made fun of. You know, there was like one legitimate guy looking into it and everybody else made fun of it. Because light was so obviously a wave. You know, they knew about the fact that it canceled each other out just like a wave. That's wave behavior, okay? And so they kind of did away with the particle theory. Then Einstein discovered the photon, which is a particle of light. Okay, and it's the basis for quantum theory. So now you got this weird thing. Okay, well, why does light, if it's particles, behave like a wave? So uh, there might be a classical explanation, right? So maybe I'm shooting a bunch of photons and they, they get a ricochet and they kind of bounce off each other and maybe that's why it doesn't hit that target. So they tried shooting one photon and it never hits that middle target. Okay, so one photon by itself is somehow creating an interference pattern, exactly the way I just showed you mathematically, so that it, it will never hit that target. Okay. Okay. So, why? Why is it doing that? All right. What, what is what's going on behind the scenes with quantum physics? Well, Richard Feynman says nobody knows. Uh, this is the kind of famous quote: If you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. Now, I'm going to go with this for the moment because uh, I don't want to have to go any further uh, down this. I do want to mention, though, that there is at least one famous scientist from back in time, and one today, whoever, David Deutsch, that totally disagree with that point of view. Um, they have an interpretation, Hugh, Hugh Everett came up with an interpretation of quantum physics 
that absolutely makes sense, explains all the weirdness, why it happens, and it's called the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. And it's the only interpretation we have that actually does explain quantum physics. Now, sorry, what was your name again? Wayne. Wayne and I were talking, and we were talking about how we don't really want it to be true. It's kind of an offensive theory, and I don't really like it. So I don't really, and it's so out there, right? So I don't want, people aren't willing to accept it when it really, really comes down to. So, um, and I don't blame them. I, I really don't. But if you do want to at least have a concept of how quantum physics, why it works the way it does, David Deutsch wrote a book and in one chapter explained it in plain English. Okay? So it can be done. I know it can be done. You just have to give in to this kind of offensive <laughs> theory as to what actual quantum physics is. All right. All right, so now I'm going to take what I just showed you with the, with the uh, double split experiment. This, what I'm about to show you, is actually no different than the double split experiment, but it's going to feel different. Okay? It's one of the weirdest things I've ever heard about quantum physics. When I discovered this, when I came across it in Roger Penrose's, one of his books, it was called The, uh, the Emperor's New Mind, which is, he teaches a lot of physics, but it's actually about him attempting to look at the nature of consciousness. And um, he went through this experiment. It's called the elitzer Vaidman bomb tester experiment. This is real, okay? Now, they've never actually done it with a bomb, but they've figured out equivalent things to run with the experiment, and, uh, and it works. It works in real life, okay? And you can look this up on Wikipedia if you want, so I'm not making this up. When I went through this in Roger Penrose's book, I like put the book down. I was so shocked, and I was like, I don't even know what to do with this. <laughs> so I'm going to take you through it, and it is very freaky, okay? So does any, are any of you old enough to remember Bugs Bunny in this cartoon here where he's trying to test bombs to see if they're duds or not? So Bugs Bunny ends up on this line where they're testing the bombs for the war. He takes a hammer and he hits it and it doesn't blow up, so he writes dud on it. And the next one comes, he closes his eyes and he hits it and he write, it doesn't blow up, so he writes dud on it. And it's funny because, of course, if it wasn't a dud, it would explode and then it's useless after that. Okay. <laughs> What I'm about to show you is that it is entirely possible to detect if a bomb is a dud or not without blowing it up using quantum physics. Okay? So it's, a, it's equivalent to Bugs Bunny except that it works. So this is the setup. Imagine this, this represents a photon source of some sort. And Roger Penrose drew it as a, a light bulb. I'm taking this. This is just a picture that I've taken right out of his book. And imagine that the, the bomb has a little photon detector on the front. Okay. And when a single photon hits it, it either it, it can detect the photon. Okay. Now, if the bomb is a dud, it just the photon just it treats it like a mirror, just bounces off of it like it would any mirror. If the photon is not a dud, it blows up just like Bugs Bunny. Okay. And so it's so far at least there's no difference between the quantum world and the classical world okay now i'm going to teach you a little bit more about quantum physics and then explain to you how we can actually put this together uh, and i've worked out the math on this i was so shocked I, this is one of the ones i spent quite a bit of time working out the math on it's not that very hard of math i have a blog post that explains the math if you're ever curious about it so First part of this experiment that I'm going to set up for you is you got the photon source, and the photon comes here. This is a half-silvered mirror. Now, the trick with the half-silvered mirror is that there's a 50% chance the photon will bounce off of it like a normal mirror, and a 50% chance it will go through the mirror. Okay? So, under quantum physics, those 50% chance of each are considered a superposition, okay? which you've often probably heard of. It's doing both. It's not quite true. I'll show you in a moment how it's a little different. But that is correct. That is quantum physics would superposition that. Okay. This is the rest of the experiment. So this is a half silver mirror. That's a half silver mirror. These are real mirrors. Okay, so 50% chance go through, 50% chance bounce, 50% go through, 50% chance bounce, 100% bounce, and these are photon detectors. Okay. So 
under quantum physics, you shoot the photon, and the way you would mathematically model it out in the matrix that I just showed you is that you would have something called they call the probability wave superpositions and goes both directions, and then it comes back together at the half solar mirror. There's an interference pattern at this point, just like there was in that double split experiment, and the photon will always come out right there. Okay, it will never come out at G ever, just like with the target. Okay, and I actually worked out the math, stepped through it. Sure enough, when you have used the complex numbers, they create uh, an absence there. It just absolutely G falls out of the equation, and you can't get to it. Okay. Um, now we're going to throw a rock on there. So instead of having a mirror, we're going to have a rock. Okay. Now, if you have a rock, there's no path here anymore. The photon superpositions, it comes here, it hits the rock, boom, it's done. Okay. Then the photon continues here. Now, there's nothing here to create an interference pattern. So now the photon will come out at 50% of either one of those. Okay, 50% of the time it hits F, 50% of the time it hits G. Okay. And that's because you don't have the superposition here anymore. Now, are you talking a single photon? A single photon. Okay. Single photon. <clears throat> so when you have a, a silver mirror that goes through there, we don't know which one it is, but there's always still one photon. There's one. always still one photon, and it okay. takes one path. Okay. Okay. That's why it's a little different than a superposition isn't quite the same as it's in two positions at once, which is how you usually hear it. Right. It's really the probability wave that's in two positions at once. Now, what's a probability wave? I could explain it to you in terms of many worlds. I can't in terms of any other interpretation because there's no other, other understanding of it. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, when they came up with it, they didn't know what it was either. Okay. It's just the word they made up for it because it's how you calculate the probability of where you're going to find it when you detect it. All right. Now, here's the weird thing about quantum physics. This is the thing, you've probably heard this from the double split experiment. Let's say that this mirror here, we put a detector on it. Okay? So now, that detector, this, it goes, you know, comes through here, it superpositions, and then half the time it's going to come this way, half the time it's going to go that way. Well, what's going to happen is, 50% of the time that detector is going to go off. The other 50% it won't. Okay, and the reason why is because 50% of the time the photon goes this way and 50% goes that way. Right, that makes sense, right? The moment you detect it, the superposition disappears. That's called the collapse of the wave function. And now, with that detector on there, you'll get 50% there and 50% there. Exactly like with the rock. Okay, why? No, no, you know. So, that is how quantum physics works. You throw that detector on there, boom, superposition disappears. Can't get the interference pattern anymore. Okay. So if you've looked at quantum physics, this probably isn't that much different than what you've heard before with the double split experiment. It really is identical to the double split experiment. It's just a little bit more complicated. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take that bomb with its detector, and we're going to put it in place of the detector there. So what happens? Can anyone guess based on everything I've just explained so far? The bomb works, it shows up in both. The bomb doesn't. You, you are really close to the truth. You know, you're really close to being right. Okay. So we don't know if the bomb's a dud or not. Okay, so we put it in there, we put it into the experiment. If the bomb is a dud, it behaves like a mirror and the interference pattern will exist. If the bomb is not a dud, it behaves like a detector, and the interference pattern will disappear. Now, why is that? It's because a bomb exploding is a type of observation, just like using a detector on a photon. Okay. If that bomb explodes, you know the photon went that way. Okay. If the bomb doesn't explode, you don't know if it's a dud or if the photon went that way. Okay, does that, does that make sense? You understand? What's going on here is the bomb is being put into superposition. So they often talk about you never see macro events with superpositions. That's not true. Okay, it just 
they say that, and what they mean is you don't like see it as two bombs. That's true. But you absolutely can, using quantum physics, you can superposition macro things without a problem. Okay. I shouldn't say it without a problem. When you start getting into the bigger world like this, it makes it harder and harder to engineer the experiment, obviously. So, but the theory continues to work, even when you've got a, something the size of a bomb. Okay. So now here's the interesting thing. Let's say that the photon hits F. What do you know? You know nothing. OK. There was no observation at all because you do not know which direction the photon took. Okay, it could be that the reason why it came out as F is because the bombs had done, there was an interference pattern and it came out with that at F. Or it could be that it, just, it, was, it wasn't a dud, but it just happened to take the 50% chance and go to, to F. Okay. So this is another thing that's interesting. The idea that observation causes the collapse of the wave function is not strictly true either. Okay, they call this an interactionless, how do they call it? Interactionless uh, observation. Okay, basically, when the detector <coughs> fails to go off here, you know which direction the photon, you have the ability to know which direction the photon took. Therefore, there is a wave function collapse, even though you never observed it. Okay, in this case, it's more clear, you know, over here. You can make the argument, well, you did observe it because it didn't go off. That's the same as if it went off over there. Over here, that's not so clear anymore, OK? If it comes out here, you don't know. You don't know if it's in superposition or not. There's, you, there's nothing in this universe, at least, <laughs> where you can say, this is the direction the photon took. You just do not know. No observation at all. What happens if the photon comes out here? You know the bomb's not a dud. Oh, right. Is it, yeah. Okay. Why is that? Why do you know the bomb is not a dud if it comes out of G? Because it means the photon was observed and therefore it causes an interference pattern. That's the only path to get to G. That's correct. And what was the observation? The bomb exploded. That the bomb didn't explode. That's right. weird, it's right? It's, it's, it really is that the bomb exploded, except that it didn't. Right. It, it, what it really, what the observation actually was, they call this an observation, it really isn't an observation. The observation was that had the photon gone this direction, the, the, it would have exploded. Therefore, there cannot be an, uh, an interference pattern. Therefore, we, it, the, the superposition doesn't continue this path, and there's no superposition to cause the interference, so it can come out of G. What makes this really interesting is I'm giving this, and if you were to work out the odds, what would actually happen is, is that you know, if it's a dud, you, know, you, would, you would run it a few times, make sure it comes out of F a few times, and you'd say, oh yeah, it's, it's, there's now a 99.99% chance it's a dud. You'd run it to whatever arbitrary level you wanted to be sure that it was a dud. You can't get 100%, but you could go to any level of surety you want. If it comes out of G, you immediately know it's not a dud. Okay? If it come, but let's say that what are the odds that if it's not a dud, it blows up versus coming out of G? Well, I can't remember off the top of my head. I, I think that what it works out to be is there's a 25% chance it comes here, 25 there, and 50% chance that it explodes. Okay, so you're still wasting a lot of bombs. It's possible to engineer this, though, to any level of accuracy you want, just by adding more paths. So you can't get to 100%, but you can get to 99.999% accuracy if you want it to. Okay? And so you put it on there, you just add, them, add more paths, allow more chances for interference, and it works the same, and then it, it will work out that it, it will hit G, and you'll go, oh, hey, not a dud, and you're done. All right, any questions about this? Okay, right, is, is, is your brain blown out the back of your head yet? Because this is what happened to me when I first saw this, okay? <laughs> this, I mean, this is very shocking, okay? It, it really is so different than anything you can... It's, and it's not the same as what you hear about quantum physics. That's one of the things that I found so startling about this. I, I'm curious. On the first uh, graph, absent the uh, observer, the you know the detector, you have a, a, a predictable result. You have a predictable result. That's correct. And um, <clears throat> if you so, when you add that, what if you add the second on the other corner? Does it revert back to a predictable result? No. If you have any observation, 
the very fact that you can make, remember that you, you lose the superposition even if the detector doesn't go off, yeah. right? And so the detector doesn't go off, so we know it took this path, okay? An observation in quantum physics is merely the ability to know. It's got nothing to do with actually making an observation. Mm -hmm. it's, you could have had it done, done this path, okay? And you, you can kind of see why this experiment kind of lends itself to something like many worlds, is in many worlds they would say, oh, well, there was an observation, it was just in the other universe, and the bomb exploded there, okay? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you can see why there was some desire to try to reformulate that way to try to make sense of it, okay? Um, but if you, put a, if you put another observation over here, what would happen is now 50% there, 50% there. Yeah. It doesn't actually, it continues to have a collapsed wave function. Okay. Any other questions about this? Okay. So if that wave function collapses, you will get some uh, observations of G, right? If the wave function collapses, you can get observations yeah, either, of G. Either way you collapse. Yeah. But if it's not collapsed, you'll never get it in G. That's correct. Okay. And so another is there like, a, like, can you go and see a YouTube experiment with someone like actually setting it up? And I haven't tried that. That it never hits G. I just, I just want to see that it never hits G. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's. <laughs> they use lasers. Yeah. All right. Good All right. So the key thing here, the bomb was superpositioned. That's how we're able to know that it would have exploded had the photon taken the other path. Um, which means, and this is a quote from. Roger Penrose, that quantum mechanics explores out counterfactuals. Counterfactuals are physically real. Okay, Roger Penrose, by the way, does not believe in many worlds, like at all. <laughs> but he still says it explores out counterfactuals. That's what a superposition is. <clears throat> Strange as that may sound. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about entanglement. Okay. How many bits does it take to store a byte? Do, do you know the answer to this one, Nate? I mean, it's kind of a technical, technical question. It's, I mean, a lot of these guys probably don't know what we're talking about. All right, so yeah, 8 bits. Well, okay. a byte doesn't have to be 8 bits. That's true. It's arbitrary That's enough. true. So, I mean, but there's really so, not an answer to that question. But. For an 8-bit computer. Yeah. You know, they still call them bytes even on a 16 or 32-bit yes, computer. But yeah, so now are you familiar with the idea of a qubit and a qubit? You've probably heard that before, right? Right, what's a qubit? Okay, so a qubit or a qubit is simply the quantum equivalent to a bit or a byte. Okay. And one of the things that you will read in magazines or whatever is they'll say, well, it can be in both zero and one, superposition, so it can be in both zero and one at the same time, and therefore it can calculate faster. And you're, you're sitting there scratching your head, why would that matter? And I can do that, I can emulate that on my computer today, you know? Well, that's because they're completely wrong. <laughs> what actually makes quantum computers work is entanglement more so than, I mean, entanglement's a type of superposition, but it's not superposition of a single qubit, it's that all of them superposition are entangled together. Okay, and I'll ex I'm about to explain to you why that's significant, okay? So, If I were to make a matrix of, say, a qubit, okay, what I would have to do is, and this can be done on a computer. The, the idea that a, you've probably heard that a classical computer can't emulate a quantum computer, that's not true either. It can. It's just severely limited, and I'll show you why in just a second. Okay. In fact, I, when I talked with Nate the first time, I said, I'm going to make a quantum computer simulator. It's going to have eight qubits, because <laughs> I don't think I can emulate more than that. The way you would do this is you create a matrix that shows every possible combination for, for eight bits, basically. So how many combinations are there for eight bits? Two to the eight to the eight. Which is? Two to the six. Okay, so you'd have a matrix, a vector, that's 256 large, and then whatever number of bytes you need to be able to store a complex number. So for the sake of argument, I'm going to say two. Okay, I don't know if that's true or not, all right? So, now you think about that. In a bit, you need one byte to store a byte, okay? But for a qubit, it's just a lot larger, 256 times two, all right? Still not huge, 
Okay, so you could do this. You could go and you could sit down, you could write a quantum simulator today with eight qubits, and it wouldn't be that big a deal. So I worked out the mathematics here. And based on my made up numbers, it was about 131K to store eight qubits. All right? Now, here's the real problem of entanglement. Any of you who are, who are willing to try this using the numbers I just gave you, so two bytes for a complex number, how many bits do you need for 90 qubits? I don't know the answer, but my, my slide does. So. Uh, it would be 256. Oh, wow, that's a big number. Yeah. <laughs> How big? Uh, that. It might be wrong. I, I yeah, that, that's, that looks too big to me. OK. So, so it would be, it would be um, 2 to the 9th. 2 to the 9th, right? Times 2. Oh, I did power of 2. That's what I'm wrong. Oh, it's 10 to the 4. OK. How much for 10? So 2.4, 2.4 would be, you had it with power, so that'd probably be 2,000. 24 e. Okay. Try 64. No. Scientific notation, please. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> this is what I calculated out. A little different than yours, but at least you got the idea it's a big number. So this would be, you know, a thousand you know, megabytes, two megabytes for nine, and then to do 64, there are literally you cannot build a computer big enough to be able to emulate. Okay, that's the real reason why we can't emulate a quantum computer, because it has an exponential, once you understand that entanglement means we have to track the relationship between every qubit with every other qubit, it is exponential growth in memory use, and that's why we cannot emulate a quantum computer past a certain number of qubits. Now, I, I want to make this clear, though. There's nothing magical about qubits. They're about as useful as a bit. So we, quantum computers, when they talk about, oh, we're going to have someday 100 qubits, it's the power of 100 bits. But you can do quantum algorithms on it instead. Okay? And so it's very limited. You know, you, you're, we're so used to um, having lots of memory. You know, it, it's just so hard to engineer. We, they actually can engineer a true quantum computer today, but it's, it's like... Eight bits, yeah, eight qubits. I mean, it's it's something that you could emulate on a classical computer, so it's completely not even worth mentioning, right? So, but they've they've, um, they've run some of the algorithms on it just to prove it works and things like that, but just, <coughs> just not very useful at this point. And other things, someone asked me about like D-Wave and their quantum computers. The analogy here is, let's say everyone was striving to make a Turing machine, okay, which is a universal computer. And it, none of them can do it, so somebody announces that they have a finite state machine, and that that's a computer too. We made a computer, woot us. It's the same sort of thing. Okay? They, they've made part of a quantum computer, essentially. So there's still some useful things. I don't know much about the partial theory. I've never looked into it. It doesn't sound interesting to me, so I probably never will. But there apparently are, from what I've read, things they can do with it where it does some speed-ups, but just nothing really super impressive. So... All right, so you really cannot emulate the uh, quantum computer past uh, a fairly small size. Okay, so now, how do you write an algorithm for a quantum computer? All right, now this is the part I have a really hard time understanding myself. I'm going to explain the basics so that it gives you an intuition for it, and, but I, I can only take you so far, and then my knowledge starts to break down. What we've got here, and we're going to do classical first. Okay, just, it's always easier to do classical than kind of related to quantum. What we have here is two matrices, and I'm telling you that this one is a not, and this one is an and. Can you see why? Is, is it obvious why, or do you, you can tell just by looking at it why it is? It represents the possible states that you can get control of states. So the reason why it looks this way is, is um, for not date, 
Let's, this is the input, this is the output. And a one in the first one is an input of zero, zero. A zero in the second one is an input of one. I mean, a one in the second one is an input of one. Do matrix multiplication, and what this really does, that, what that matrix does is it flips the bits. So if you put in a zero, you get a one out. If you put a one in, you get a zero out. Okay, can everybody can see that's kind of obvious, right? Nothing particularly difficult about that. The and's a little harder to understand, but if you were to work out the matrix uh, multiplication, and just, just real quick, the way matrix multiplication is, is you just imagine bringing it over here, multiplying together, and then multiplying each of the cells together, and then adding them together. That's what matrix multiplication is. A little more complicated than that, but that gives you pretty good intuition. So this is um, an, it's a, an AND, obviously. If you were to build a circuit with AND, you've got two bits going in and one bit coming out. Okay? And that's what, exactly what we see here. This position is 0, 0. This is 0, 1. This is 1, 0. This is 1, 1. Okay? If you put a 1 here, run the matrix math, this is what comes out. Then it's true because you had a 1 and a 1 coming in. Okay. The key thing I want you to understand here is that if you were to build a circuit that does this logic, these matrices are a simulation of it. Okay. They, they represent the same thing using a matrix. Okay. Now, and, and who's familiar with the idea of one hot encoding? This is, comes from machine learning, deep learning. Well, they're really using something similar to one hot encoding. I mean, one hot encoding, they do the same sort of thing where they blow it out and use a label for each, each cell in the vertex. Um, I kind of already explained this, so I'll move on here. Okay, so now, there are some limitations to quantum physics, and therefore, because quantum computing is quantum physics, limitations to quantum computing, and they are fairly severe. Okay, you'll actually be surprised what they are. Um, the first is, is that it must be reversible. Quantum physics is always reversible. There's no such thing as non-reversible quantum physics. Uh, well, there is. It's called an observation. So, now, I don't know if you know this, if you've looked into this at all. The Land... I can't pronounce that. Landers principle says that a reversible computer, you can have a classical vers reversible computer just like you can have a reversible computer that's a quantum computer, that it does not use energy, okay? A reversible computer does not use energy. And the reason why is because energy use comes from, from energy use, when you run a computer, it gets hot, right? What's heat? Heat is entropy, okay? Entropy is equivalent to a ratio because you lose the information. All right, this is just physics, okay? And it's, you probably never thought of it this way before, but this is just physics. Therefore, the use of energy and the heat that comes off of a computer is solely comes from a ratio of information. So when you write stuff out to your computer, it uses no energy, and then when you erase it to do something else, boom, you just use energy, okay? And that is just the laws of physics. So if you have a reversible computer, in theory at least, it would use no energy at all. Now in practice, it would be impossible to engineer a completely reversible computer. However, there are, the physics allows for, again, any arbitrary level of correctness, right? I mean, you, you will never get to 100%, but in theory, you could engineer it to be 99% reversible, 99.9% .9 reversible, 99.999% reversible. And as you go down that level, you're reducing your energy usage. Okay? Now, you might say, wow, you know, that would be incredible, computers that don't use energy. It also takes energy to actually get the result out. Okay? Not very much, but it would take some energy to get the result out of this reversible computer. Um, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is that how do you make a reversible computer? Well, it has to never erase anything. Well, that's going to be pretty limited, right? And imagine if you go try to write a program. And never mind, at the CPU level, everything's getting erased anyhow, so there's nothing you can really do. But just try to emulate this in a real program, okay? Do it in C so you can bit twiddle, all right? It's really hard to make something 
reversible. It's really hard because you have to store every state and remember what the previous state was. And there's clever ways you can get around it a little, you know. But you, you, at some point, if you're familiar with computational theory, it's P space, right? One of the things that comes out of computational theory, I'm going to talk about computational theory in just a second. One of the things that comes out of it is that it's much easier to write a program that uh, utilizes space than time for the obvious reason that you can erase memory and then reuse it, where you can't erase time and then reuse it, okay? Well, a reversible computer, essentially, space and time are now equivalent. So it's just as hard to write a, space, a computer with space as it is with time. So that's a pretty severe limitation, even though it does take no energy. Okay, now this is where things get critical. We just talked about not and and. Is not reversible? Absolutely. Just not it again and it goes back to the way it was. Is and reversible? It's not. You cannot build an and gate for a quantum computer. Hmm. Okay. That's a big limitation. It is. <laughs> we don't have a computer without those. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to show you. Okay, it's actually very clever what they came up with. Okay. So, the solution is that we need to make a gate that performs an AND but is also reversible. And then there's a gate in the <coughs> textbook called the Toffoli gate. Toffoli? Yeah? I, I don't know. How to pronounce it. <laughs> What's that? Terrible. 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 Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When, when I came in here, I was talking with Phil and I said, Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of a little worried because I don't really understand the subject that deeply. He says, It's not like somebody in the room is going to be able to challenge you on this. <laughs> <laughs> So a Tavoli gate, I'll show you what a Tavoli gate actually looks like. Okay, this, is the, this is what it looks like as a circuit. This is what it looks like as a, a matrix. Okay? Now, let me do my best to try to explain this. I, I understood this a couple of days ago. All right? A Tavoli gate, um, I believe that's a tensor product, actually. Or maybe it's an AND. I can't remember. But that, that's the picture of what it looks like. Let me show you how it lays out, though. So you've got, you know, exactly what you expect, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, et cetera. So you've got every combination. Same thing on this side, okay? So in, in this case, you know, you could be dealing with, how many are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 bits. Uh, 3 bits, really, but 8 combinations, sorry. So if you'll notice, though, on this pattern that exists, okay, on the Tavoli gate, the only thing that, this is actually the identity matrix, except that these two are, are flipped like this. Okay, the identity matrix is the matrix, just like you can multiply any number by one and get the same number back, multiply any matrix by the identity matrix and get the same matrix back. And the reason why is because when you have ones all diagonal like that, it just basically gives you the same matrix back out again. So this is almost, full gate is almost an identity matrix, except that this is twisted. Okay, now that little twist, is amazingly powerful now because if you look right here, if I input 110 and 111, I actually get either a 0 back or a 1 back, and it's, it's backwards. So if I, put a, if I put a 0 here, that's equivalent to, ignore the first bit, um, a 1, 0 here. If I put a 1 here, Sorry, just look at the last bit. I put a zero here and a zero here, you get one. And you stepped a not matrix at the end of that. That's right. It's a not matrix. Okay. So you, what you do is you basically just ignore the first couple bits. You still have to have them because they're necessary for the reversibility. Okay. But you do that, and this is actually equivalent to a not. Okay, so you've got a knot. You can use a Tavoli gate to emulate a knot. Okay, the same thing is true for AND. So if I were to look over here, and this is a little hard. Um, ignore the first bit. Only look at the shaded ones. One and zero is zero. Is zero zero. Zero and zero is zero zero. One and zero is 0, 1. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so. Uh, 
actually, it looks like they used the first two bits, sorry. <laughs> so one one, and you get a one back, okay? So it's equivalent to an AND, all right? So they just use parts of the matrix, and you can still get a NOT and an AND. Now, what's special about a NOT and an AND? They make an AND gate. What's the special about an AND gate? Any other kind of gate from an AND, no combination of AND. Tofoli gate is universal, therefore must be universal, because you can make a NOT and an AND. Make anything out of a knot in an hand. That means quantum computers are universal just like Turing machines. Okay? Within the limitations I just explained. It has to be reversible, you know, don't have that many bits to work with. But you can, in theory, make any program into a quantum quantum computer can be put into a uh, can be put into a quantum computer. Any program can be done in a quantum computer. Um, just an engineering problem from this point forward, just a really very hard engineering problem. Okay. Now, okay, so programming a quantum computer. The way, when I think of programming, I think of C sharp, right? You, you write ifs and stuff like that. It just would not work with a quantum computer, okay? Um, quantum computer has to be reversible. You know, how would you even make a compiler? Maybe you could, I don't know. I don't, I don't think they exist at this point, but how would you make a compiler that ensures reversibility? <clears throat> okay, could, could you do it? Is it possible? I don't know. Okay, well, we certainly don't know how to do it. All right, so if you're going to be programming a quantum computer, it's like going back to the early days of computers where you're basically wiring things up in circuits, equivalent to that, quantum equivalent to that. Um, or it may be, if you could represent the circuits as little mnemonics, it would look a lot like assembler. Okay, and I'll show you what that looks like some, from a real quantum computing language. So it's actually a lot more like electrical engineering than it is like programming, okay? So you have to like stop and, 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 and it, you don't think through the logic. It's not, it's not an algorithm in the sense where, okay, I'm gonna, if I do this and then this, then that should give me the answer. It's, it's a lot more like setting up a quantum experiment, okay? And in fact, that's what you're really doing. A quantum computer is a box that has a revert, you know, you can set up quantum experiments over and over again and see what the results are, okay? And using that, they can use that, the power of that superposition and the, the entanglement in some cases, and unfortunately it's very limited, in some cases they can do some really tricky things with it where it defies what a classical computer can do, okay? And I, I gotta tell you, this is the part that I can't remember that well. But what I do remember from when I used to understand it is they would set up the program in a straightforward way and they would superposition everything and then they would observe it and it was useless because it would immediately collapse and you'd get no, you would get no more information than the classical computer. So then they would come to this really clever way with the circuits to superposition this and then entangle that and then do this and you have to make sure it's reversible the whole way because otherwise it won't work. And, once you get to the very end, you observe it, and the answer comes out, and it gives you some little piece of information that you should not have <laughs> because of that entanglement and the way the collapse works. And then you use that piece of information. It's a single bit, in, you know, maybe more than one bit. It's just a few bits. You use that to then run a normal computer and speed up that normal computer because you now know something that it can't, a normal Turing machine can't know. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you, I will explain to you some of the algorithms. I can't give you the in-depth look, but I can tell you about what the algorithms do. Okay, and I'll explain to you what I mean here in a second. So, um, and I gotta tell you, it is very, limited. David Deutsch is a physicist, a famous, famous physicist. You can like see him on TED Talks or something like that. And he's got two excellent books. They were the ones that actually got me into quantum physics. Um, Fabric of Reality and uh, the Beginning of Infinity. Um, David Deutsch um, is the father of uh, quantum computational theory. So, I don't know, for his PhD or something, he sat down and said, okay, what can we do with a quantum computer? Is it equivalent to a Turing machine? And he worked out, you know, just like I did for you with the Toffoli gate, that yeah, actually, you can take anything you can do in a normal computer and you can do it in a quantum computer. Therefore, a quantum computer is equivalent to a Turing machine. And then he went on and he wrote a paper, <coughs> one that I cannot understand. 
where he demonstrates that actually a quantum computer can do some things a regular computer cannot do. Okay, now, we're not talking about the speed ups. That's what you usually hear. That's the sexy part of the quantum computer speed ups. We're talking about able to compute something that a normal computer can't compute. Unfortunately, it's super esoteric stuff that you probably never use in your life. If I remember correctly, it's able to do full analog instead of just the digital version. Now, as you know, you can use enough bits, you can emulate it to any level of accuracy you want, right? But a quantum computer can do apparently full analog. What can you do with that that you can't do with a normal computer? I'm not even sure. Okay. That therefore, though, took the existing computational theory, which is called the Church Turing thesis. You probably heard that if you computer science and you took a class in computational theory. And you now call it, the, they still use the Church Turing thesis because, of course, we mostly work with classical computers. But the prevailing theory of computational theory is no longer Church Turing, it's now Church Turing Deutsch. And you can look that up on Wikipedia also. Okay, because, because technically a quantum computer can do some things a regular computer can't do. Although I'm really unclear what that is, and I don't think anybody even knows. But it's able to do some things because it can do this uh, non discrete So how does that affect our affinity of recalling the Turing machine a universal machine? It is it's not a universal, universal machine. machine. So that's, that's, that's not what it true. means. The Turing machine that's is not what a universal it means. model of computing. So, you know, David Deutsch goes into this, and this is a very interesting subject in and of itself. It deserves its own presentation. The Church Turing thesis is false. It's been falsified, just like Newtonian physics has been falsified by Einstein's physics. And in turn, Einstein's physics has already been falsified by quantum physics, or at least that's what we think is true, because we're not a little, we're a little unsure. Uh, most likely quantum physics is right and, and general relativity is wrong, because they told you they were in contradiction. So quantum physics is generally assumed to be the better of the two theories. Um, there's, nothing, there's nothing really all that magical about it, right? I mean, when Turing made up his uh, theory of, uh, you know, for computers, for universal computers, he couldn't really conceive the concept of quantum physics and how that would be different than a Turing machine, right? And so because of that, he came up with the most universal thing that he knows how to make. Okay, now here's the thing that's interesting about it. Okay, this is what David Deutsch brings to light when you read his books. If I were to say, what is computational theory? What, like, what category of discipline does it fall into? What would you say? Computer science. Math or computer science. <laughs> Either math or computer science. That's what everybody says. It's physics, says David Deutsch. I was going to say intersected with physics. Just cut me off. Yeah. So, <laughs> he says that the computational theory is a branch of physics, and they mislabeled it. That what the Church Turing thesis actually says is in a classical world, what can be done, period. Okay, because classical world computes, right? It does stuff, it's, we know how to model it in a computer, that's because it's doing something equivalent to what the computer's doing, and the classical world will never do a computation that a Turing machine can't do. Okay? The quantum world can, but it is matched by the quantum computer. The quantum computer can do anything that the quantum world can do. Okay? And that's actually the significance of each of them. If you had different laws of physics, you would have different types of computers. They're they are intimately tied to physics. Okay? Th this is an interesting thing. I mean, I've, I've read other books on this ever since then. Sieber Sieber Pinker. Um, writes a number of books. He wrote one book about the idea of a computational mind. Okay. Well, you know, there's, there's pretty good evidence that our brains just simply cannot do anything that violates the church turing thesis. All right? you know, if you were to like say, how does, how does our eyes, and this is an example from Stephen Cooper's work, how does our eyes take a 2D representation and turn it into 3D? Well, that is a physical impossibility for a computer. So we shouldn't be able to do it. Oh, so that's proof that we can do something that a computer can't do. Wrong. Computer can do it if you cheat. Computer can do it if you make an assumption like light always comes from above. Well, that's what a brain does. And there's tons of evidence now. You go take a button, you know, and turn it upside down. It looks like it's pressed in instead of pressed out. It's because your brain is hardwired to assume light comes from above. And there's a number of tricks like that your brain does so that it can turn 2D into 3D, and the computer can do it too, okay? So in terms of what your brain's able to perceive and what it's able to do, it does not violate Church-Turing thesis, and nothing in nature does until you get to the quantum world, 
okay? Or at least to the best of our knowledge. Obviously, these are all scientific theories, and they can all get falsified at some point. Okay, but that's, that's the current best theory on the subject, if that makes any sense. And here's the interesting thing. If you could find something in the physical world that violated the church Turing thesis, you could then use that phenomena in the real world to build a different type of computer better than the church Turing thesis. Does that make sense? Okay. So, all right, let's talk about uh, quantum computer algorithms. Uh, my textbook has two completely useless ones and two actual useful ones. I'm going to talk about the two useful ones that it was, goes over. Um, the first two ones are just to kind of give you a feel. And even those I can't figure out anymore. So Grover's search algorithm. This is probably easiest to explain because it doesn't go, it doesn't fully explain Shor's algorithm, which is the one that's the sexy one that everybody wants to know about. Grover's search algorithm is actually probably more important than Shor's in most cases. It's just not, not so sexy, right? It doesn't, it doesn't do something so, quite so amazing. So Grover's search algorithm, if I remember correctly, basically, you know, imagine you're trying to search stack of numbers or something. You're trying to find a specific number. For the sake of argument here, we're going to assume that you're trying to only find one and there's only one in it. Are we talking ordered or unordered lists? It was uh, unordered. You're just, okay. you're just searching for something in whatever. It's just normal search algorithms. You think of any search algorithm that's trying to find something. Okay. So Grover's can emulate any search algorithm. The trick here is, is that Grover's, you, you put those circuits in together and you do it in such a way and then you do the observation at the end and lo and behold, the observation, if it comes out this way, it means that the number's in the top half and if it comes out this way, then it means the number's in the bottom half. Okay, so you just, now you can cut well, how much you just search by half and you can do it again, cut it again, do it again, cut it again. And the end result is, is that you can get to where it's a tractable problem for a regular computer and then run it on a regular computer from that point forward. Okay. Now, how much of a speed up is it? It is not exponential. It's quadratic. All right. So if it took um, uh, I can't even remember off the top of my head. If it took uh, 2 to the x, you know, big O notation, 2 to the x, it would be, you know, square root of x instead or something like that. Okay, so it's, it's still not that fast, right? But it's faster than a normal computer could ever possibly go, all right? Now, so it's a quadratic speed up on all searches. Now, here's an interesting thing, though. Oh, I'll get to that in a later slide. Shor's algorithm is the one everybody really wants to know about. Now, who doesn't know about Shor's algorithm? Has everybody heard of Shor's algorithm? Have it? Okay. Shor's algorithm is what put quantum computers on the map. Right. There's weird people doing it, and nobody really cares. And then one day, Shor's algorithm gets published, and now every government in the world is interested in quantum computers. And the reason why is because Shor's algorithm can crack any encryption on a classical computer. It can crack any classical computer encryption. Um, and it does it exponentially faster. It's the holy grail that everybody wants on a computer. All right. So, Right now, the way encryption works at a high level, I don't really understand encryption, so Phil knows more than me. But the idea is that you use large prime numbers, and you multiply them together, and then prime numbers are, the search algorithm for finding prime numbers is super long, right? If you get a big enough prime number, you can pretty much guarantee that if you throw a computer out and try to find it, that some will explode before they actually find a solution. So they're relying on the fact that, the, that under the church Turing thesis, it's not possible to compute the prime numbers that the encryption is based on. Okay, it's just, just, it can be done, it just takes too long. So it's not useful to do it. And that's the whole basis for encryption. Short's Shor's algorithm can do it in 15 steps, I'm making that up. But it's a very tractable number of steps. And it can take any, any encryption, it can find the prime numbers, and then have the key, and boom, you're in. Okay? You can see why governments might be interested in this, right? Um, here's an interesting thing that I want you to all think about. David Deutsch points out that the fact that we already have, we, we cannot engineer a quantum computer. We don't know how yet. We're working on it. It's still a ways off. 
But the mere fact that we already have Shor's algorithm means, in a certain sense, that we're already cracked. So let's say you're the Russians, and you want to know all the US secrets. Take all the encrypted secrets, store them on a server, wait for a quantum computer, then read them. You know, if, not that uh, you know, abandon on the internet is going to have a quantum computer, but collect all the credit cards. Put them in a storage server, wait for a quantum computer, use them. Yeah? One of the many Snowden papers, as you'll see in one of my presentations, well, I didn't record it, but the uh, Snowden presentation that I did, one of those papers shows that the NSA has already been doing that exactly for that reason, just as you described. Yeah. I, there's no way every government in the world, that this, you know, at least first world or second world government in the world, hasn't already done this. Well, and the funny thing is, right close to where you live, <laughs> <laughs> that's where we're storing it. Yeah. So and that's a little scary. The fact that encryption is already is theoretically already cracked. We've already cracked all encryptions. If you've ever watched sneakers, that whole premise of sneakers is the fictional finding of an algorithm that can crack crack encryption. It's true if you have quantum computers. Okay, it's not true in real life. There's actually good reasons to believe it's impossible, although we don't know that for sure. Okay, so now here's the uh, here's the good the good thing though. The quantum computer giveth and taketh. So there's something called quantum encryption, all right? And quantum encryption is uncrackable, period, because it's built into the laws of physics. So there's no way, barring discovering some entirely different theory that allows you to do it, there's absolutely no way ever you can crack it. And the reason why is um, because, as I've just been explaining, an observation causes a collapse of the wave function. So if I'm using quantum encryption to send you a message and you decide you're going to snoop it, all right, we can tell you're snooping it because the wave function keeps collapsing and our packets don't match. We go, oh, oops, someone's snooping us, boom, and we're done. So there, there is no way to crack it. It's uncrackable. So now, so it's good. We'll have to eventually get rid of current encryption once quantum computers come around and we'll have to start using quantum encryption instead. So. Will that be in my lifetime? No, I don't know. Maybe in your lifetime, maybe. Yeah. That's important stuff to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let's see. Oh, and also, also because of the no cloning theorem, under quantum physics, I don't need to understand this really, but there's something called the no cloning theorem. Um, you know, in, in a computer, I can cut and paste information. I can also copy and paste information. In a quantum computer, you can't because the laws of physics under quantum uh, mechanics has something called the no cloning theorem that you can never clone the state of any, anything that's in a quantum state. You cannot clone it. You have to destroy it to make a copy of it. So it's like moving it effectively, right? And so because of that, the no cloning theorem is not possible. You know, today, one of the things you might do with snooping is you might look at the packet and take a copy of it. If you do that, it's gone. You know, is that because our boom. universe already has that information, and therefore there's a second <laughs> universe that has it? <laughs> the <Maybe>. world. <laughs> All right, this is an example of a quantum program, and I have no clue what this does. But I took this off the internet. Uh, like I said, it really looks more like a circuit board. Right? Like, I, I do know what this is. This is the, I can't pronounce it, the Hazzat Brat matrix or something. Basically, it's one that superpositions everything, which is something that's obviously you're going to do a lot with uh, quantum computation. These are the uh, measurements at the end of the computation. Okay, so this is what a quantum computer program looks like. Nothing like what you're used to. This is the text version of it. This is an actual language they've already invented for use with quantum computers. And again, it doesn't look, I mean, it looks a little like assembly language, right? And that's what they call it. They call it quantum assembly language. But, um, I know, measure here, select this, apply that. I mean, it, what you're really doing is you're setting up, you're using this language to set up a, a quantum experiment, a quantum physics experiment that you know will give you some piece of information that will help you do computation. All right. What's that? So it's there a lot. Yeah. All right. Quick camera. Quantum computing is just a giant uh, 
word before. FPGA. FPGA, yeah. It's funny. <laughs> the primary computational theory, because this, this is pertinent to the last thing I'm going to try to explain here. Um, you mentioned MP complete. Okay, so I'm going to explain what that is. So there's different classes. If, you, if you're in computer science, they force you to take a computational theory class. You spend the whole class going, what has this got to do with programming? And you ignore it. And it's taught so dryly when, in fact, it's one of the most interesting subjects on the planet. <laughs> but anyhow, I can do a separate presentation on that sometime. So polynomial time. next month. <laughs> <laughs> polynomial time um, is a class of programs that can be completed within polynomial time. Polynomial means, you know, x to the 10th, big no, big no notation. I've got to search a thousand records, so a thousand to the tenth, something like that. That's big, right? So it's going to be a slow. It could be a slow program, okay? <clears throat> but it's going to be nowhere near as slow as the next category, which is NP. All right. So polynomial time is defined by the use of a deterministic Turing machine, which is really just a Turing machine. Okay. If you can run it on a Turing machine as polynomial time, then we call it class P. So that's pretty obvious. Okay, so let's talk about class NP. So class NP is 10 to the X. So it's exponential growth. So, you know, the traveling salesman problem is NP. It's exponential growth. You more paths you add, and eventually this is the point where you just can't compute it. I mean, you can, but it just would take too long. Same with quantum encryption is an NP problem. Okay. So it's defined either as a problem that can be confirmed in polynomial time on a deterministic Turing machine, or that can be computed in polynomial, polynomial time in a non-deterministic Turing machine, which is not a Turing machine, <laughs> and in fact can't physically exist. They're just theoretical computers that we use for the same computational theory. Uh, they're, they're massively parallel, basically. And I don't mean massively parallel in the way we mean it in the real world, it's like infinitely massive, massively parallel. Okay. And if you could build an infinitely massively parallel machine, it would be a non-deterministic Turing machine, and it would be able to run all NP programs in P time. So NP and P would collapse into a single class. Okay. Now, they are, and interesting, by the way, I gave you two definitions. Those are actually mathematically proof that shows that those two are the exact same thing. Now, there's another class called NP-complete, which is part of a subset of NP. Okay. Now, NP-complete, that was what you were talking about. It actually came about because people kept wondering, is P and NP the same class? And you'd say, well, why would it be the same class? You know, I mean, one is in polynomial time and one's not in polynomial time. The problem is, is that if I give you a problem, and then I say, oh, here's the solution, and that's an NP solution. <laughs> How do I know for sure there isn't a P solution hanging out around there somewhere mm -hmm. that I just haven't discovered yet? Okay? Because of that, there's at least some chance that P and NP are the same thing. Maybe every NP problem has a P solution. Therefore, NP doesn't exist. It's really just all P. Okay? That would be great, by the way, because that would mean all problems, the computational problems, are tractable. Okay? Now, um, as it turns out, everybody's pretty convinced that they're not equivalent. Just intuitively, it feels like they're not. But they, they couldn't prove it. And again, this comes back to physics versus math. Okay? They couldn't come up with proof. So what they did is they came up with scientific evidence that they weren't equivalent. And a lot of what, what they do in computational theory is very much like science rather than math. Okay, where they go out and they collect evidence and it's not sure, and they build a theory and they can't falsify the theory and they try, and so therefore that theory is accepted. It's actually identical to science, and that's why it really is a branch of physics, not math. Although it has proofs, so it's a little bit of all this goes. So um, NP complete, they, 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 they show, they said, okay, here's this NP problem that if you could, if it, just pretend for a moment that there's a P solution to it. We don't know what it is, but let's pretend like it exists. Okay. Can, what, 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 would we, what would we know if, if we took this problem and we had a P solution to it? Well, they, they showed this problem is universal problem. 
Okay, so if you can solve this problem, you can then map it to any other problem in the MP class. Right? And they proved that mathematically. Or one time I knew how to do that. <coughs> I knew how to do that. So certain MP problems are MP complete, which means they're universal problems. If you can find a P solution to them, every MP problem is a P solution, has a P solution. And what you would do is you would use the P solution on the universal problem, then you would do the mapping, and there would be some sort of mapping between the universal problem and any other problem, and then you would have the answer. Okay, so it's, it would still be, the mapping is not NP, so everything would be in P time. So because of the existence of these MP complete problems, it seems really unlikely that P and NP are equivalent. <coughs> Okay. Um, I mean, what are the odds that we haven't found it at this point? And it exists and we haven't found it. When in fact, every single one of them is really, can just use this one solution for every single problem, right? I mean, it just it seems so far-fetched. So they, they use that to marshal evidence that NP was not equivalent to P, and then that was good enough and they moved on without proof. Okay, so why is this all significant? Um, David Deutsch, who I mentioned was the father of quantum computational theory, I read an interview with him where he said, quantum computers are not a significant rank He says they're, they're, they are in their own right, but nowhere near as important as the discovery and understanding of the classical computers. And um, this is a quote from my book here. It is to be stressed that although Shor's algorithm solves the factoring problem, factoring is not believed to be NP complete. Okay, it's, just, it's an NP problem, but it's not an NP complete. So some researchers believe that the fact that there was a quantum algorithm for factoring of the factoring problem, the encryption breaking problem, is a fluke and not something that should be expected from any problems. They believe that methods similar to Schur's algorithm will not be very helpful for other problems. Okay. The fact is, is that quantum computers do not collapse NP to P. They do not solve NP complete problems as of today. We don't know of any algorithms that solve an NP complete problem in an exponential time. So, um, and, and that's unfortunate because if, let's say the factoring problem had been NP complete, we could then use a quantum computer to make every NP problem tractable. That would have been incredible. That would have been bigger than the advent of the Turing machine, right? I mean, it would have, made almost every problem you can imagine tractable. There are things that are outside of NP that are NP hard, and not necessarily those. But it would be most problems. Now, Broder's algorithm, on the other hand, um, it can be applied as a search on a 3SAP or a Hamiltonian, Hamilton, Hamiltonian graph, which are NP complete. Therefore, Grover's algorithm means that quantum computers can give a quadratic speed up to any algorithm, which is good, but just nowhere near as impressive as exponential. And it still means that NP problems are intractable. So, but it does show how a quantum computer has got some real future in, com in computation because of a program like Grover's algorithm. For almost any program you can look at, you can say, hey, you know, this is tractable, but it's taking too long. We can use a quantum computer to speed the process. Um, now, here, here's something interesting. This is also in my textbook. If the class computer, quantum computers are not fast. They're very slow. They, they may get faster over time, but I mean, we can't, it, you know, it takes something like minutes to do, you know, one step. Um, and hopefully they'll, they'll improve that speed. But we shouldn't really expect quantum computers to be faster than classical computers. Classical computers will probably always be faster than the quantum computers. The key is that quantum computers, in certain cases, can do it in fewer steps. Okay. So a classical computer, let's say a classical computer is 100 times faster than a quantum computer. Um, they worked out the math in the book. Grover's algorithm will start to, the quantum computer will start to beat the classical computer, even though it's 100 times faster, at n equals 15. Okay, now it's not a huge beat, but it will start to beat it just because it's got fewer steps to go through. Okay. So it is the number of steps then. So the number of uh, the times where you're the, splitting the thing in half, right? Right. It's, okay. And it's from and it's big O to big O. Fifteen is really low. It is very yeah, low. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, which is why quantum computers do have a future. They're going to be very interesting. They're not going to be the giant breakthrough you hear about, but they are going to make an impact on, the big impact they're going to make is that they're going to make it so that absolutely nothing's encrypted. That's the big impact they're going to make. After that, they will continue to have a place in um, computation as a way of speaking certain algorithms up in certain cases. All right, so unfortunately, Robert Allen cannot move in P2P. Now, we don't know. I mean, maybe someone will at some point come up with a quantum algorithm that solves an empty complete problem in P time. And if it does, that would be a gigantic breakthrough okay, for quantum computers. But so far, we don't know. Any. And that's really the end of my presentation. Do you have any questions about this? Like, Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> have I really blown your minds? <laughs> I'm glad tomorrow off. <laughs> you know, when I first started reading about quantum physics, I used to go to people and say, you know what, I, I think my brains just blew out the back of my head and they splatted on the wall. Because <laughs> it just is such weird stuff, you know, and it's very interesting, it's, it, it's intriguing, but it's, you know, it's just weird. <laughs> yes, you mentioned the cosmology really on. Yeah. I'm curious as to how you... How I do that? Well, no, I look at the Okay, so the cosmology is just a general term, right? So when you hear about cosmology, you're usually probably thinking of like Big Bang. Trying to explain things. Right, so cosmology is trying to show, use the laws of physics to explain what the universe was like, how it got started, you know, or something like that. That's, or how it's, in theory, it could also be how it's going to end. But nobody seems interested in that. Very much the only big exception to that. Push that button over. So, uh, <laughs> so cosmology is, is trying to understand what are the implications of physics for reality. Right. Well, obviously, quantum physics has some sort of implication for reality, mm -hmm. even if we can't agree what it is. But you, you, had, you, had, you had mentioned that you had an interest in one. Okay, so what, I got, what, I, what that means in plain English, it's not as amazing as it sounds. What that means in plain English is I really could have cared less about doing quantum physics for its own sake, or doing experiments, or becoming a quantum physicist. I was just really curious what quantum physics said about reality. That's cosmology. So here's something interesting. David Deutsch, who does believe in many worlds, he has pointed out that most quantum physics, most quantum physicists do not believe in many worlds. But overwhelmingly, quantum cosmologists do. And so that's why I think you're seeing that. You start hearing about it all the time now. It's gaining ground. And I suspect, within another decade or two, it will be the prevailing theory of quantum physics. Um, just because it's got such stronger explanatory power compared to all the alternatives. So, you know, does that make it real? I don't know. And that's, that's the question for every theory of science, right? Is you never know for sure if it makes it real. They used to believe in the ether. So right. Yeah, who knows right. What it is. <laughs> for now, that's what we'll go with. So, but, yeah. the ether. <laughs> it, I mean, many worlds, I, I could do a separate presentation on many worlds and try to explain it. Uh, one of the things I find interesting, I, you have to understand, I do not like many worlds. I just, one of the main reasons I started looking into quantum physics was because I read David Deutsch's book, and I'm like, he believes in many worlds. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. And so he mentioned Roger Penrose, doesn't believe in it. Well, Roger Penrose is also a cosmologist, just like David Deutsch is. And he says, he mentioned Roger Penrose and him were basically at odds and everything, and a totally different theory of reality. So I went and bought Roger Penrose's books specifically so that I could know the alternative to many worlds. And when I came across a Roger Penrose book that uh, Elitzer Vigman bomb experiment, I went, oh my gosh, that's many worlds. And, and the deeper I looked into it, there just really doesn't seem to be a good alternative. I mean, there may be one which I haven't fi figured out yet, come up with yet. But like I read, I read um, a philosopher who's a philosopher of quantum cosmology. So he's not a physicist, but he knows a lot of quantum physics because he's trying to understand what it means for reality. And he did a review of David Deutsch's books and really attacked the fact that David Deutsch says there's no alternatives to many worlds. He's very forward with that in his books. He says, you know, Boehm is really just many worlds in disguise. He makes these claims, and he doesn't really back them up because they're strongly technical subjects that he doesn't want to get into. But he, he makes these strong claims. And this philosopher was making, you know, really attacking him on this front. He made his review of David Deutsch's book. 
And he says, there are absolutely better alternatives. Quantum, many worlds isn't even the best view of you know, cosmology of quantum physics. So I went and I bought his book, The Philosophers. And I'm like, all right, finally, I'm going to have an alternative to many worlds. By the time I was done, I was way more similar to many worlds. <laughs> he, he, first of all, he only covers many worlds in one paragraph, and he clearly did not understand it at all. And, and I guess I don't blame him because it's a little hard to, I mean, it's not hard to understand, but there's enough about it, or enough misinformation about it, that when you first hear about it, you've already been trained wrong on it. And because I learned about it from David Deutsch, who understands that he is the foremost expert on many worlds in the world alive today. I learned it the right way the first time, or most people learned it the wrong way the first time, and so it's very hard for them to then make the connection, because they've learned it wrong already. And that was clearly the case with this philosopher. Furthermore, he goes over bones, and I was like really excited for bones. I've heard great things about bones. And I was stepping through it, and I still don't fully understand it. But he, he gave me enough of an intuition for how it works, Frankly, it's ad hoc. It's an ad hoc theory. You know, it's not a good explanatory theory. And so it could be true. The fact that it's not a strong explanatory theory doesn't make it wrong. But uh, it's a bad sign. It's a bad sign for that theory. So, so this philosopher <clears throat> made a conclusion on that thin air. Yes. Why? I, I could show you. I could show you the map. No, I mean, no, I mean, math. I mean, I'm just thinking the fear. He was afraid of losing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I am too. Many worlds isn't so good. I want to believe it. I can understand why people resist it. I'm just thinking that, you know, there's so many things that color the thought process. Yes. Yes. And that's that was the interest for me in looking at the whole cosmological. Yeah. Yeah. And we definitely come at cosmology as a little we have to start with our intuition, right? I mean, a lot of science is counterintuition. But you have no choice but to start with your intuitions. And then once the data disproves you, then you're forced to come with a theory that's counterintuitive. And so I, I can understand why, and the fact that there's this initial resistance of a new idea, we would kind of make fun of scientists for that, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I mean, it means that a, a theory has to survive severe criticism before yeah. it's going to be accepted. And the fact that they're bigoted toward, I mean, one of the things that, like, um, Kuhn uh, brings out in his book is that it used to be, we're actually better than it used to be, that it used to be that the way one theory went out and the new one came in was that the old scientists died and the new ones died. <laughs> <laughs> and that, for the first several centuries of science, that was how theories changed. And, and, and we do do better than that today, like um, standard, the standard model was accepted very quickly. Um, and it's a crappy theory, too. I mean, we all know it is. It needs great improvements. But the fact is, is that scientists, as strange as this may sound, they're way more open-minded than they used to be. Although they're still not that open-minded. <laughs> they're human, right? And one of the things that David Deutsch brings out in his book is that, it, it, well, he doesn't bring this out, but he quotes Popper, who does bring this out, Karl Popper, that this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Right? I mean, we, we have this idea that we should be impartial and we shouldn't have biases. And actually, the world works because we do. That's what Karl Popp claims. Well, so, I mean, at the end of the day, it seems like we're still trying to define the outside of the box from, from the inside. Yeah. I mean, really. Th there's so much we just don't know. You know, I mean, we, we know so little, really. And I mean, the, the idea of a box is an interesting idea. You know, no. kind of see the world like this, and the box is oh, a little bigger. Yeah. And, but we're always in a box. We, well, we really we're, can't. Regardless of the, of, the, of the size, if it's material, we I mean, use you know, the notion of material things that are, as the box. You know what? You know, absent that, what do you have? Yeah, and, and, and you know what? That's actually the basis for Karl Popper's theory of knowledge, his epistemology, theory of philosophy of science. All those the same thing is that um, you go with the theory that has survived the most criticism. And you're justified in believing it, even though it will ultimately be proven wrong in some way. Because that's, what else would you go with? There's, there's nothing better to go with, therefore you're justified. And if the justification isn't 
philosophers have spent years trying to figure out how do we justify the authority of science. Karl Popper skipped the whole issue and said, you're justified believing in science because there's no, science produces the theory. The theory in science, the prevailing theory in science, is the one that we don't currently know how to break. You know, we will eventually figure it out, and we'll make a new theory after that. But right now, it's the best theory, and the way we know is that it survived the existing criticisms. And science has its limitations. Too. Yeah. And so, and, and this is actually defines one of the main limitations of science that you can never know anything. Science, it does represent what's happening in reality, but you never get to know how. I mean, and you never get to know how close you are. To 